Hello and welcome, Talon here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at CQB tactics, CQB movements, or other things that you should consider or be aware of if you're doing single man or a multi-man uh, tactical maneuver, uh, whether it be indoors or outdoors, airsoft or even real steel, since sometimes these can go hand in hand. Um, I know that there is like that gray line of you're gonna do tactics for one, but not for the other and vice versa. And I get that. I think it should be very, relatively easy in order to distinguish tactics that could utilize in one versus the other. Um, but I'm gonna help clarify that for some of you guys. So, I've got my bin of tactical stuff. We'll be going over some movements, stuff like that. And we'll even do some room clearing stuff in a future video. So stay tuned for that, but let's get into it. So full disclaimer, I have no military or service related backgrounds. So I want to make that clear first and foremost. Everything that I know and everything that I'm talking about is based off of my own personal experiences within Airsoft, which again typically is a little bit more tactically involved compared to a lot of other normal civilians um, going to trade shows and having uh, interactions with service members, law enforcement, doing training with SWAT and other law enforcement agencies as literally a living, breathing target um, has allowed me better insight and conversations with a lot of these actual service members um, and be able to present that to you guys. Now going at this from the perspective of Airsoft exclusively, this may also save my butt if any type of government agency were to uh, target or do any type of deep dive on me of like, oh, he's becoming too sentient, he's becoming hardcore. It's all for Airsoft fun. Now, first and foremost, before we get into anything as far as that cool guy tactics, movement, there's a lot of things that need to go into consideration on your end specifically as the end user. Now, because we don't have any type of agency protocols, regulations, we have a lot more freedom to build our systems up to what we would prefer. What I'm currently modeling off is a very under-armored, under-protected uh, chest rig with a pack system. Now this allows me a lot more maneuverability and a lot more comfort when it comes to these uh, more confined spaces, whether it be a vehicle, moving around in an indoor environment, or just being able to breathe and not have a lot of weight on me. It also limits the amount of uh, magazine capacity or other accessory options that I would be able to carry on me. Now that could also open up to the fact that I could wear a belt setup. Maybe uh, you are an individual that doesn't like chest rigs and you don't like belt setups. You might want to go with just a plate carrier and get all of your uh, systems situated just around your to torso here. Some other accessories you may want to consider would be uh, communication. How well do you want to uh, communicate with any of your teammates, squad members, or even friendly forces? Um, that's all up to you, your own prerogative. Do you feel like you need to carry a pistol, a sidearm? Um, for certain airsoft events, um, if I've got a really good rifle setup, I may just say, hey, we are in a very large space. It's even more weight that it gets distributed onto my body. And the actual chances of me pulling my pistol in an actual Milsom environment, extremely, extremely, extremely slim. I'm not gonna say absolutely zero. Some other accessories that are oftentimes forgotten about is gonna be some type of ear protection or some type of helmet mount. Now, in the case of these two options, the helmet is more so going to be for any type of bump protection. Um, helmets are heavier compared to a baseball cap or even a boonie cap here. This gives me uh, protection, so if I'm ever in an indoor environment where you may typically find me, if I'm rummaging around in a space where maybe I shouldn't be, um, so this has saved my noggin more than once. If any of you have cracked your head onto a concrete 
corner, uh, you know that that is not, not, not fun. And boonie caps are not gonna do a real, real good job uh, with protecting against that. This helmet also doubles as my recorder. So I have on here GoPro footage. Uh, you can find it on this channel, uh, some of those Milsim events. I recently came back from Operation Arsenal um, and I plan on going to several more of those events as well. Very fun um, and they also allow for that immersive environment for getting your kit set up in a more hardcore tactical situation uh, and really test the limitations of your kit specifically. However, with those larger events, that means that there's also a lot more hardcore guys. So you may want to very heavily consider any type of hearing protection. Now this is not only hearing protection, but it also is going to double as a sound amplifying device. So um, this is going to cut off, uh, I believe it's 90 decibels or 80 decibels of sound. So if a sound grenade goes off, that's going to cut all of the sound going into my comms, so it protects my ears, especially when there's airsoft grenades on the interior of these buildings. They can sometimes, within close proximity, get up to around 140 decibels. So these grenades can be extremely loud and really bad for your hearing. Not only that, but it also amplifies quieter sounds. So in this current clearing, it's doing a really, really good job picking up a lot of the cricket sounds that are happening in the area. I can, of course, turn that off. Uh, it also doubles as communication. So instead of going directly to my walkie-talkie here, my Beofang radio, um, I don't have my push-to-talk with me that I would typically talk into. This does double as that communication piece. So if I'm maybe not doing frontline work, if I'm maybe like a squad leader or platoon leader or some type of radioman position or role, uh, what I can do is I can just kind of sit passively on this radio, do that communication, and then get into the, uh, into the action whenever I need to. And again, from the point of view of Airsoft specifically, we have significantly more freedoms and flexibility for how we're going to get our rifle setups configured. This is how I like to configure most of my rifles. So I usually go with a battery powered system, usually a 10 to 11 inch barrel length, short and compact. Um, I don't need incredibly long barrel length to give me crazy distances. Um, I do have a tracer unit, a top flashlight, a hand stop, always a two point sling, magazines, and I have a red dot with a flip up magnifier. Again, to your uh, discretion, get your stuff set up to however you want. I know multiple guys that will bring multiple rifles for prioritizing different environments. So they have like an outdoor rifle and then they have an indoor rifle, which is not to say a bad thing. You also have the flexibility because this is airsoft and we don't have uh, any type of, um, I would say company wide exclusive uh, configurations. So like not everyone needs to run an M4 platform. You could go with maybe a PDW that may be souped up. Um, so some guys might have this as their indoor rifles. Some guys might have, as, have this as their outdoor rifle. Some guys might go with just this, a little short PDW system. It makes it extremely lightweight. It does make it easier to transport. You do get typically twice the amount of magazine capacity on your kit. Get out of here, B. Get out of here. So you get double the magazine capacity in a small compact a platform. And who doesn't love a small compact platform, am I right? <laughs> uh, folds up really, really nice and easy, so it's super convenient to get really tight to your body and get into those odd positions. Now, that is not to say that this is for everyone either. There's, again, limitations to what this is capable of compared to that. But that is not what this video is for. So the first thing that absolutely comes to mind for the biggest takeaway, the biggest tell um, that someone is coming around a corner is going to be silhouettes. Silhouettes specifically when we are looking at skylines or even silhouettes of shadows on the ground. I cannot tell you the number of times I have fired 
three or two rounds into a doorway before that person actually peeked out and they literally peek into the BB smacking them in the face. It is the, the, the single most thing that will tell uh, myself where other players are, but it also tells other players where I am. And that is going to be shadows. So watch right here. Watch right here in this pocket here. So if I'm going to be an enemy player and you don't see me because of the vehicle, right? I am behind hard cover. You can't see my body. I can't see the camera. I can't see you guys. But what can you immediately see with this shadow? You can see that I'm hanging out here. You can see that there's an actual person silhouette. And guess what? If I've got a rifle and I'm starting to come up to a corner, the way that someone approaches a corner in anticipation for peeking means that they're going to have their rifle pointed upwards. Let me actually grab my rifle. See, the way that I see most people approaching corners is they might have their rifle in a, in a low ready or a high ready position as if they're, they're not aiming down sights, but they're just coming with the rifle and kind of just checking the corner out. And then when they actually want to peek a corner, they're gonna do a pause and they're gonna start to make a very small but consistent lean approach. And guess what? You already can tell. You know where I am on the shadow. I'm not even peeking the, the door here in order to see the camera. So by the time I make it to here, you might already have your rifle up anticipating the corner. And guess what? If this was a real firearm, you have your rifle already pointed at this doorway, blowing rounds through the door and taking me out. Of course, uh, that's only if you are 100% sure that I am a bad guy and not potentially um, some type of friendly force. But that, that right there, years of playing airsoft, that is the easiest way to get made if you are approaching the corner. So always be aware of your shadows and be aware of shadows on the ground. And that leads to the next point. So airsoft specifically is going to be a game of close proximity. Airsoft BBs only go so far. It helps to see where a BB goes. That's why I have my flip to center. This magnifier that's going to pop up whenever I need to. It's extremely minimal, but it has been super advantageous in a couple of circumstances where I need to identify targets, uh, either camo patterns or how many people are in a window. Um, it has already been extremely crucial and I'm very glad that I was able to pick it up. Is that green right there? This is certified not positive. Green on this corner right there. Yeah, that's green. Where are we going again? Now this is the real uh, SIG uh, magnifier as well as the real Unity flip to center. So these are together, I think. 400 or 500 dollars so i spent a pretty penny on it but it has been absolutely instrumental now when we're talking about optics in particular i have gone away from optics that have a lot of meat or material in the construction of the housing themselves which means if i'm running a eotech that is an extremely bulky of optic now airsoft eotechs are not very well manufactured I just don't like the amount of material that's built up around it. In the case of my, my preference, a T1 replica is what I like to go with. Um, it's just, it really is just a, a single dot. Now, that allows me, with the housing of this optic in particular, it allows me to have a better sight picture as well as uh, a lot more clearance for identifying what is in my environment. Because there's so little material that the optic is built upon, that makes it easier for me to, with parallax, with both of my eyes open, kind of see through the optic. So if I'm sitting here, I can, with both eyes open, I can see through the majority of the optic body which means I can see my target, maybe window, and I can see the window to the left of it, maybe even two windows to the left of it. And I can say, hey, target window third to the right, uh, fourth from the right is going to be enemy movement. So it's very easy to identify and make those small adjustments within your field of view. Now, as far as with magnifiers, 
This is a real SIG magnifier, the Juliet 3. And this is a real Unity Tactical uh, flip to center magnifier. So instead of putting your optic or your magnifier off to the side, now granted in Call of Duty, uh, when they had that flip to side magnifier, super, super cool, loved it in the campaign missions, hated it within real life. So I had to patiently wait until uh, there was a good option for a lower profile system. Um, and by all means, set your rifle and by extension your kit, or really set your kit up and by extension your rifle to be a lower profile. So uh, on the very front here, I have just a little hand stop here. Um, and I have a, on the very top here, that 12 o'clock rail system. I have a flashlight that whether I am shooting right-handed like so, or left-handed, like so, I am able to actuate and turn that flashlight on super, super, super easily. Um, that doesn't, that means that I don't have a flashlight body here, I don't have another flashlight body here, and I don't have a laser system, or maybe an infrared light. You know, I'm not doubling or tripling up on mass on the rifle body itself. So that keeps everything it does not snag on my uh, gear whatsoever. And that I am a huge, huge fan of. My preference, low profile, keeping everything slim. So don't get bullied into thinking that you have to base your kit or your equipment off of one specific individual or off of a specific military group or platoon setup or anything like that. You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to go with a chest rig or a plate carrier. You know, there's no military group that is utilizing this. A lot of people utilize ARs. By no means does that have to be the norm. If you want to utilize and rock an AK, go for it. I don't see enough people rocking AKs. I highly encourage it. You don't want to go with an AK, you don't want to go with an M4, G36s, AS valves, MP5s, uh, PP19s. You want to go bolt action rifle or designated marksman rifle, go for it. I highly encourage that you do this. We don't have enough people that are utilizing those roles accurately. You know, use that high magnification optic to relay information where enemy troops are, which direction they're moving to, or if they have any type of equipment or any type of mission objective that we need to get back. You know, I encourage that you do that. Now, I gotta spend a second in order to set up our next movement, which is going to be, as simple as it sounds, walking. All right, I do need to make a note that with this GoPro, I do have hyper smooth off. So any type of jostle should be evident. All right, I am going to walk normally upright, just finish with the game, walking back to the car so I can go into the mall and go grab my Orange Julius drink. Ooh, what would it look like if I do that same movement with a rifle? And I'm trying really hard not to do that roll trick because <laughs> I just naturally do it. Do you guys see that dot jumping back and forth? Not super smooth. Now, what would it look like if I'm walking, but I'm doing that uh, smooth crouch, or not crouch, but I'm doing that smooth rolled movement. Now you should notice that it is much, much, much smoother, excluding the few little jostles as I'm taking that step. So from here, if I've got my rifle in my shoulder and I'm doing that slow, smooth, it should be much more apparent how smoother this is. So even if I were to stop, get into contact, my red dot is going to be so close to where my point of aim is going to be then I should be able to immediately disengage safe and have my uh, finger on the trigger. It'd be really cool if I had like a shot timer with like a crazy long delay so I could do the slow, smooth uh, walk. And then as soon as that beep hit, 
I'd be able to take a shot. But alas, there's nothing like that. All right, so I've got here my starting point, which is gonna be right behind my camera. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of starting room. That's gonna be where I'm ending. I'm gonna start with the smooth walk because that's what I'm used to. So it's gonna be the most natural. Um, so I'm gonna give myself a couple of steps before I start shooting and we're gonna aim for 20 total shots. So here we go. All right, that was 12. I'm getting a little too close. It might be a little unfair. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and two misses. So 18 out of 20. Now I'm getting a little too close. So notice how I did nine shots instead of the 12 with the first run. So I'm not as confident with my shots. I'm having to be a little more patient when I get it. Uh. Okay, that was 17. So it took me a couple more passes in order to get those. Again, I'm taking my time when I get those shots, so I'm expecting myself to get more shots on paper. Tactically speaking, we may not have the opportunity to go back and reshoot, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18 out of 20 shots as well. Looking at this, as far as perspective. Yes, I technically did have more shots inside of my grouping uh, for my upright walk, but I will say that the concentration of consistency is within here, this group right here, compared to here. So I think that if I were to have transitioned these groups upwards a little bit more, I would have had more shots inside of here. My shots on the smooth walk are favoring the right hand side. So everything is a tighter grouping, excluding the two that walked off on me. And we even had that one to nick the paper right here. So we know that I'm favoring in a tighter vertical orientation compared to my upright walk has significantly more left and right variance. So everything for smooth was here and over. For my upright walk, we're at halfway of the paper and even off. So my actual box for shooting on my upright walk is significantly larger than that of my smooth walk. My smooth walk is within an A zone. My upright, I'm going from an A zone into a C zone. Now also, that is, is not great. I'm very confident that I can do much, much, much better. Give me just one more chance to prove myself. Let's do this. Already, that is significantly tighter compared to my first smooth walk and definitely tighter than my upright walk. One, two, three, four, five, six inside of there. And then seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then one down below. So smooth walk does win. 
Now this brings us to about the end of our video. However, I'm not absolutely done. Check the timeline. The one last thing that I wanna leave you guys with is a technique that is actually more self-taught over the years. And recently I've seen a video done about this topic in particular, but it's what I have referred to as the three S's of surveillance or self-intelligence. So maybe not self-intelligence, but it's, it's what we're looking for in environments. The three S's stand for sight, sound and smell and these things apply to airsoft as well as within the real world as well um, as it's the video that i was watching but the three s's sight sound smell and you're wondering how how do these apply within airsoft so sight is what are we looking at what are we looking for within airsoft specifically are we looking for maybe a casual pickup game are we looking for camel patterns or are we looking for specific armbands those are things that you constantly are looking for and scanning for when you're within your environment and for me uh, because i have my flip to center magnifier get off of there ant i actually have a option in order to look more closely and inspect what camel patterns or what armbands uh, a group of guys might be off in the distance and so i can better relay that communication to my teammates as far as hey those are enemy forces we're going to move this direction towards them or those are friendly forces and we can help support them by going this alternative direction right Sight also can refer to, as we're scanning not only our environment for human bodies, but we're also looking for specific mission objectives. Are we looking for ammo canisters? Are we looking for gas canisters? Pelican cases, what look to be uh, SAM sites, missile objectives. Are we looking for a computer system? In the case of very high-end MILSIM environments or MILSIM games, they will require that we have some type of computing system to pull literal files of information off of uh, uh, computer systems that are in the Milsim environment, which is very, very, very cool. But we oftentimes for air softwares will overlook them. So we have to continually to scan that environment. Look on the ground. Are we looking at shadows? Are we looking at broken glass that we could step on, which is going to then create a sound, which is going to give our position away? Are we looking at um, concealment or cover you know these are things that we're constantly scanning for and we're constantly inputting into our into our brain sound what are we hearing do we hear uh, the muffle of echoes as we're in an interior environment which is going to carry sound much further compared to a wooden environment a wooden environment if we're hearing dudes shouting that typically means that they're much closer than they actually are so are those bad guys or are those good guys in the case of that sound we can create a low profile ambush towards them in order to then physically see and identify are those good guys or are those bad guys these a lot of times go in tandem sound are we hearing the scrape of a gear or kit against a wall or a doorway again this is something that we're going to talk about in the next video when we talk about actual cqb type uh, things to consider when we hear that scrape of kit against uh, a wall, we know where they are. Are they good or are they bad? In the case of shouting, are they shouting about enemy movement? Are they shooting about an, uh, shouting about an armored vehicle, a tank even, or directions? Are they shouting for help? Um, what are some things that we are, uh, <laughs> the sounds that we hear, are they, airsoft grenades or are they airsoft uh, BBs smacking up against a wall um, and can we hear the report of the rifles actually shooting those BBs sometimes they're quieter and sometimes they're a little bit louder that can also tell us the direction where that enemy contact might be from smell as odd as it is smell can actually tell us a lot more information in the case of smell the amount of times that I have smelt the uh, airsoft grenade powder or smoke grenades in a very close proximity is either going to tell us that there ha is conflict or there was conflict very, very recently. When we're in an indoor environment, CQB specifically, the smell of airsoft grenade powder going off lingers for a couple of minutes. As I come into a doorway and I've entered a room with my teammates and I smell that powder, now we know that it 
we're going to get into a gunfight. There's a very, very good chance. We don't know if it was the other team or uh, our own team that threw that grenade. So we have to go with a higher sense of uh, caution and be much more careful as we're clearing through these rooms. Smoke grenades. Smoke grenades have to be uh, much closer and have a thicker concentration of that smoke in order to have a literal scent to us. So we know that if we're in uh, maybe an exterior room and we have some windows and we smell that smoke grenade, guess what? We can peer through that window and we can identify with sight what is happening. And then because we see that, hey, they threw a smoke grenade um, over a hill, our team is assaulting around that hill, but there's enemy contacts on the hill specifically. So we can either engage those enemy players or we can shout and relay that information to our team as they're advancing. These things oftentimes go hand in hand, but you have to constantly scan, you have to constantly be listening, and you have to constantly uh, be aware as to what is in your environment. So those are just a small little handful of things that I have learned that may be super advantageous to you guys. Uh, things to definitely consider as you're going through, maybe not only in the real world, but also airsoft as well. Um, and maybe gives you an insight that some of these airsoft events can actually be much more hardcore than maybe what uh, YouTube or Facebook clips actually portray these. And maybe even get you uh, into a bunch of games themselves. So. Let me know down below if you have any further questions um, or anything in particular that you would like to look for um, or at least like to know about. I'm always a wealth of information and happy to share that with you guys as well. So hit that subscribe button if you stay to the end of the video. Go to mckydex.com down below as well as like and share the video. I don't know why I paused. That's really bad. It is 11 o'clock. The sun is out and it is definitely warming up. Time to get to room clearing before I do any other review videos. It's getting warm.